We have got an exciting two sessions for you uh, over the next uh, hour and a bit. Uh, but what we want to talk about is something that has come up a few times in the last little while, uh, and it's about education and, and uh, how to uh, get more people into uh, science and technology and engineering, uh, how, to, how to develop thinking around that. Many of you have had questions about uh, things that go beyond the actual discipline that you're studying, but sort of how to be more complete participants in, in policy development. And a lot of that does start in education. So we're going to have that discussion. Now, because I've got four panelists here talking about uh, this topic, uh, I want to take questions only on the app for this part of it, for, the, uh, for this half. Once this panel goes away, we'll revert to the other plan where we'll do the catch box and... Uh, the mics, but for this one, I want to take questions only on the app, and I do want to ask you for the next two sessions, uh, please keep your, your questions specific to the topics that we're uh, discussing. I, I will ask you, I think, as I've said many times, and I will keep on saying this over the last couple of days, I don't think I've ever moderated uh, such a smart uh, conference with such smart panelists and such smart, uh, such smart audience. As you all know, much of this has gone over my head for much of the last two days, uh, but uh, I will ask you again, in the interest of getting as many questions in as possible, if you would try and, uh, if you have to write it out first, that's okay. That's kind of why I like the app. Let's just get to the question so that we can actually get to an answer as quickly as possible. I want to try and get as much in the next couple hours as possible. Uh, I want to introduce our fantastic panel, and they are all here around a particular program that uh, is being uh, executed at uh, Thomas A. Edison High School in Alexandria, Virginia, but they all play different roles in this program. Uh, so we're going to hear from all of them, and then we're going to get your questions on it, and we're going to talk a little about it. To my immediate left is Scott Setta. He's the program manager of technology and en uh, engineering education and STEAM integration at Fairfax County Public Schools. Pamela Brumfeld is the uh, principal of the Thomas A. Edison High School in Alexandria, Virginia. Dr. Katie Sherry is, uh, Sherry is a senior fellow uh, of the Knowles Science Teaching Foundation. And Francis Reyes is a global STEM challenges student at Edison. Uh, welcome to all of you. Thank you for being with us. Uh, and to get us started, uh, Principal Brumfield, will you tell us what this program is? Well, the Global STEM Challenges Program is a program that integrates science, math, technology, and computer science. And the curriculum is taught in an integrated manner. Instead of students learning these topics very discreetly in silos, the curriculum is integrated. So you would think about it years ago, a student would go, here's my biology class, and it's for maybe 50 minutes or 90 minutes every other day. And then I switch class and I go to my math class. And very often students did not see the connections between the curriculum. They didn't see the connection with the real world. Well, this program integrates those topics so that students see how really in the real world, they're not totally discreet. The students work on projects throughout the year so that it is very hands-on and it is problem-based. They work on solutions to real-world problems. The students are in groups. They've learned how to problem-solve, work with other people, and it really pushes their thinking to engage them in critical thinking, problem-solving, and there's also quite a bit of the unknown. Uh, students have gotten accustomed to, they're not always right. They've gotten accustomed to that part of learning requires that you fail and try again. And for many of those students, that's been a departure. They've been used to, up to this point, you go into the classroom, the teacher provides the information, you study it, and you kind of regurgitate it back. This program doesn't do any of that. And so the students had to really learn how to ask a lot of questions. It's very inquiry-based. The program starts out in ninth grade, and so it starts out with a cohort. There are 90 students in the cohort. The same cohort will continue and work together through grade 11, and each year we will start a new cohort. The students have three teachers who primarily work with them, and the teachers have about four and a, four and a half to five hours every other day 
in which they facilitate the learning for the students. So there are 90 students. We have a very large space, and we have multiple rooms. And the students can be in a fabrication lab. They can be working on computers, technology. They can be having a, a science mini lesson or a math mini lesson as they work on real life problems and projects to solve. So we just completed our first year with the program. Uh, it was a very successful year. I think that the students, as well as the teachers, learned a lot because you have to also realize for the educators, really we haven't provided the structure for them to teach in this way. So this has been a first time opportunity for everyone. And we've had a lot of success in the program this year. Scott, thank you for that. And uh, I, I already see their questions coming in about this. Scott, how did this come to be? Uh, this came to be, we have a, uh, a current Fairfax County Public Schools resident, and Fairfax County Public Schools, if you're not familiar, is just across the river, or the 10th largest school district in the country, just under about 200,000 students in our, in our school district. Um, and we actually have a, a, a parent that works for the National Academy, Academy of Engineering who reached out to me uh, as the, the STEAM and STEM coordinator for our school district about the grand challenges and, and what's happening at the collegiate level and what opportunities could could potentially exist at a K-12 environment. Um, so we dove deep into this and we work collaboratively with, within our own school system, but also with the Virginia Department of Education. We applied for a grant that allowed us to teach some of our programs and courses a little bit differently than, than other schools are allowed to based on current requirements. Um, it provided some flexibility in what courses our teachers could teach. It provided us some flexibility in the seat hours. So could we give them for credit for work-based learning experiences or experiences that they're not actually sitting in a classroom in front of a teacher, uh, but still learning that content? Um, and, and once we had some flexibility through those uh, requirements, we sat down as a school district uh, with our science coordinator and our math coordinator and our engineering um, program manager and really started to look at the grand challenges and how could we narrow those down and how would they impact students in our own community and make these grand challenges, take them from a global grand challenge as to how we can make these realistic challenges that students can solve and have an impact in their own community. Um, we worked internally. We also worked externally with Dr. Sherry's um, group, where she's going to speak about, and developing curriculum that would have, again, allow students to move away from asking the question of sitting in their calculus class and saying, why am I learning calculus? Let's give them a problem and say, you need to learn calculus so that you can solve this challenge. And it's really flipping the paradigm of education, and that's what this program is all about. So Dr. Sherry, teachers of science and math uh, have been teachers of science and math for however many centuries we've been using these discrete ways of, of doing things. I mean, we often look back at Renaissance people who had to study lots of different things, but they were still taught in, in silos. Now you, you're asking teachers to do something that's very disruptive to their way of doing things on an experimental basis to start with. How do, you, how do you make that work and how do you scale that to other math and science teachers across the country? It's a good question. So the, the capacity that teachers have to be flexible for what their students need is infinite. Teachers are responsive, they care a lot about their students, and one of the things that teachers always do is try to ensure student success. And it turns out that when you're looking at engineering design, Ensuring success can actually be a hindrance because productive failure is so critical to learning about engineering design. So one thing that we worked on after coming up with a curriculum centered around the grand challenges, specifically around food for ninth grade, water for 10th grade, and energy for 11th grade, the people from my organization, the Knowles Science Teaching Foundation, co-planned units of instruction around those themes. And then we've worked with the teachers throughout the year to ensure that productive failure be a part of their ethos in the classroom, even as students and parents and sometimes admin push back against it. Um, I want to give a shout out to one of our teachers who's here, um, Amol Patel, and he's been struggling through that learning cycle and that curve with his students, understanding how it's important to achieve milestones of promise, success, and milestones of failure and working with the teachers and the parents to really see that that's uh, I important. can't imagine, though, in this hyper-competitive world of college admissions that uh, that's easy to explain to parents that we're trying this out, we're learning together. Uh, there might be some failure involved, and it's like, not on my watch, yeah, we not have, with my kid. We have the advantage that when you throw out the word STEM, it really does speak 
a strong message to parents who believe STEM equals success. But it's not just STEM equaling success, it's understanding the purposes of STEM, the humanitarian aspect of the grand challenges, and rolling all of that into the fact that we believe you can still learn all the same content messages that are in those siloed courses through the integrated courses. Uh, Francis, let's, let's go to you because you're where the rubber hits the road, right? You're the product. Um, how do you feel? What'd you think? Why'd you do it? You know, and how has it changed anything? Answer any question oh. you want, because really everybody wants to know about how this worked for you. Exactly. Okay. So in like the beginning, uh, since I was a kid, I wanted to be a doctor. That's all I wanted to do. And then as I would, they were like, yeah, we have this STEM program at Edison. And I was like, STEM, what is that? Let me, let me go check that out. So they had this interest meeting. And so I went to see, and it, it's, it, it was really interesting to me because it wasn't like a regular or normal classroom. How Ms. Brumfield said, you regurgitate what they tell you. No, you have to use the information that they teach you, internalize it, and use it in a project that you have to do. And it also teaches you that communication is key. Because when you're working, uh, when you have a job and you're working, people look for that um, characteristic that you can work with other people, that you can socialize and have and find more ideas. And, and in a regular classroom, I felt myself working more by myself. And like, I have to do this worksheet, and then I have to do it, and I keep, have to do this, and this, and this. And in STEM, it's more like, can you help me with this? Do you understand what this is? Can you? And then you work and progress as a team. And I really like STEM. It's really fun. And the opportunities that it gives you, like for example, here I'm speaking in front of all of you guys. <laughs> That's going to look so good on a college application. <laughs> um, <laughs> Oh, that's funny. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Um, I, I guess uh, one of the things in your, your bio uh, says that you enjoy being challenged and figuring out different ways to solve an issue, which is, I think, the motivating force behind so many people here and the reason why the grand challenges uh, are something that engineers want to do, because they don't want a necessarily a narrow application of their, of their wisdom and learning. They want to solve problems. You want to identify and solve problems. Do you feel, I know it's hard for you to compare because you didn't, you didn't do a program that wasn't the one you were in, but do you feel somehow better prepared to start down this road of, of solving problems? Yes, definitely, because the teachers, they've, they're, they're not going to, in a regular classroom, they just tell you what you need to do. They explain it and that's it. In STEM, it's more of the teachers, they don't baby you and they're like, yeah, that's, that's wrong. Like how a regular like, math teacher, like this problem, she'd be like, yeah, that's wrong. In STEM, it's not like that. They're like, okay, but why do you think that's the answer? Or how'd you get to that conclusion? And it better prepares you for, for, um, for yourself to be more assertive of your work. Because in like, regular classrooms, like, you have to ask questions and I, and let's have a person who doesn't ask questions because I'm like, what if it's wrong? What if that question's wrong? That's like the wrong type of question. Like, and in STEM, I ask the question because I need to know. Like, I need to know if that's the right answer in order to keep going on with my work and keep not holding my team back. Like, because we all need to be on the same page. I need to... I forgot the question. But. Well, I got to. Someone has asked a question here that I actually want to get to with you. Uh, how do you get the parents, some of whom may not be exposed to STEM, involved in the students' education? Did you have any issues with your parents? You you liked the idea of science already, so they felt that you were going down that. My road. mom was like, "Go ahead, yeah. yes, do this. This seems really good. It's a good opportunity." And like, it wasn't. I didn't get a point either where I was like, "Oh, this is too hard. I don't want to do it." And even if I was like that, my mom wouldn't have let me either. She's like, you, you signed up, you got to stick with it. You ain't right. going to, no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Principal, what did, you, what did you have in terms of uh, parent feedback? Most certainly. I think that part of this involved educating parents as well. Mm -hmm. We had parents who saw the word STEM, and they saw it simply as an opportunity to get their child um, you know, kind of an advantage meaning if it's on my child's resume or application for college, that's going to get them in. And so it's a matter about really helping people to refocus that it's really for us about the learning. It is really about helping your child develop skills that will be lifelong skills. 
So when we say to parents, yes, we want your child to go to college, but do you really want your child to be successful in college? Do you want your child to be an independent thinker? Do you want your child to be able to think critically? Do you want your child to be able to evaluate and synthesize? So you have to begin to have those kinds of conversations with parents. Um, and again, parents very often wanted to protect their children from any kind of failure. So we had to do much more in terms of educating families because people know education through their own experiences. Right. So parents went to school a certain way. They are most comfortable with their children experiencing school that way. So it's not a matter of just educating students. We also have to educate our parents who have children participating in the program. So Scott, uh, there are parents who uh, rightly or wrongly believe that a good high school education prepares their children for the standardized testing that gets them into the colleges that they need to or the uh, scholarships or funding that they need. Is there, are there parents who sit here and say, what's the bottom line effect on standardized testing which schools have figured out how to teach to? Right. And that's where we are right now. So we're in the first year of our program, so students haven't been tested on standardized testing. So uh, we will find out this year how, how the scores are impacted by this type of learning. Uh, we've done it in, in smaller aspects in classes throughout the county and had demonstrated success, but nothing to this magnitude. Um, I just saw a question pop up. I'm going to jump to it real quick. Yep. About um, one point specifically about this program, this program is for all students. Um, this is not a magnet program. This is not a program where students applied and had to have a certain GPA and a certain um, background before they were able to enter into the program. It's for all students. You walk into the program, it's as diverse as any other school in our in classroom in our county. Um, and that's really what we wanted to, to demonstrate from this is that all students can be successful by differentiating the instructional practice. Um, and I think another thing that we've kind of talked about with our parents is, is this program at the collegiate level? And how will students from this program be moving forward if they do choose to go into a, a collegiate or apply to a four-year or two-year university? What's happening with the Grand Challenges Scholars Program across the country? And just in our own state, we have five that will be starting in the next three to five years. Um, and hopefully there is that transfer. The students are developing not only this understanding of the content, but also developing these 21st century skills, or what we call in our district the portrait of a graduate attribute. So how do we communicate our ideas effectively? Not only do I know the content, but I'm able to communicate it with others and share that information out. Uh, I, we have a question here that's gotten a lot of likes, and that is that the program looks fantastic, but should this be aimed at students much younger? In the UK, most uh, nine or 10-year-olds have already decided whether or not they want to pursue a career in STEM. How can we use this to influence our curriculum? I don't know if that's true in the UK, but uh, what, what's your thought uh, about this? I think that people like Francis already knew when they were kids that they wanted to go into STEM, whether or not they identified that on a form. We have critiques of some countries where children have to choose very early what they want to go into. So, and the entire liberal arts education is set up to involve an opportunity for multiple pathways all the way through the 16th grade. So I'm not positive that we'd want to put such a hard line on whether STEM is or is not your identity at such a young age. That feels antithetical to me. I think the idea of being inclusive at later ages and making sure that the door can open from those later ages to the higher education, engineering schools, graduate schools, postdoc schools, all of that, those, those doors need to be open for more people, not closed for people that didn't select it when they're nine or 10. That's how I feel. So Francis, are you better prepared to go forward as a doctor, do you think, or to, to be educated to be a doctor? And do you feel that you have as much exposure to people who weren't in this kind of a program to other opportunities? Um, I, I, I don't want to become like a doctor anymore. I want to become a biomedical engineer. Wow. <laughs> All right. And I, and I do feel like I am more prepared. Mm -hmm. uh, STEM has um, opened me to things that I didn't, wouldn't have been exposed to as if I was in a regular classroom. Like for example, um, I think differently now. So my friend, she said, yeah, I have to do this lab report for science. I'm doing this thing on mealworms. And then I was like, have you started a design brief? Because <laughs> if you're in the STEM program, design briefs are huge. They're a compilation of all your work, the scientific method, and how, how you're working to get uh, to solving your problem. And it's, I think differently, and I feel like the way that I think is now more um, what people 
uh, that are looking for now. Like, uh, if I wanted to start working somewhere, I feel like I'm more prepared, I have a better set of skills than I would in a regular classroom setting. Scott, is, there, uh, is this a program that makes sense for people who are not headed to a four-year university? Absolutely, because I think what we're teaching is problem-solving skills, which all of us do on a daily basis. So this morning, I wanted to come down here and commute in from Washington, or Virginia. What's the best way to get to Washington, D.C. from Virginia? It's a problem I need to solve, right? We all have to go through a problem-solving process, whatever we're doing in our daily lives. Um, we talk to students that aren't necessarily interested in going to engineering, and is this the right program for them? We think so, because you're, you're developing those life skills. How do I question things? How do I question things that exist out there? Think like an engineer, even though that's not the pathway I'm going into. And I'd, I'd like to add to that the fact that kids who are normally disengaged from science and mathematics find so much contextual interest and engagement in this program mm -hmm. is powerful for students who are not considering a four-year university experience. Students that might be considering a trade school experience could get the valuable background in mathematics and science that they need for success in that school by becoming engaged in high school learning that they normally would be disengaged with or have been filtered into a lower mathematical level or have a different mm -hmm. set of opportunities. This becomes a way to pull them up and to call them into that sort of training. Principal, are there uh, danger? What suffers as a result of this? What is a student not getting? What have you taken off the curriculum for these students in order to accommodate this? We actually haven't taken anything off their curriculum. The students still have access to English, liberal arts, the arts, fine and performing arts. So this is one part of their schedule, but they have access to everything else that we offer in a comprehensive high school. The difference is that we are simply saying that. We feel that kids, if they have the opportunity to apply what they're learning, if they have the opportunity to create projects, that is authentic learning. And that's what we are actually creating in this program. So there isn't anything that the kids are at a disadvantage about. What, um, uh, Dr. Sherry, again to this question of standardized testing and learning, as this evolves, is there a danger in having to standardize it to make it, to replicate it, or is that a good thing? In other words, when, as programs or as, as modules are developed or as problem sets are developed, do they, are they different all the time to achieve a, a goal or do you start getting a bunch of them that repeat themselves? We haven't tried to scale it, and thus far we've decided that the way to build the curriculum is to pair some people who are experts in engineering integration with content experts who already teach their high school classes. So the units are developed with the teacher in the classroom, and then those are implemented in that teacher's classroom so far. Um, the units that were used last year for ninth grade will be used again for ninth grade, but they're going to be changed, and we already began that process in the last three days out at Edison High School with the teachers who will be teaching this year's course. Uh, some of those teachers carry over from last year, and then there's a new addition to the team. The teachers who are teaching the 10th grade course are co-developing units that they will be teaching in the 10th grade course. Um, we've clung to the food and then water and then energy system of looking at the grand challenges in order to get more of them in by sort of broadening it out. Um, and it's been, so far, we haven't had to scale it across Fairfax County, but in my vision, you would still bring in the teacher who will be teaching that curriculum to help co-develop the actual use of the curriculum. Even if it had broad themes or broad topics, um, it could still involve them as a contributor. The lessons that we've planned with teachers have not gone down to the, to, like you said, the problem set level. Got it. They've gone down to the activity for the day, the sort of guiding premise of this unit, and the guiding premise for the individual sequence of events within the unit. Francis, uh, you don't seem, you seem to be a pretty social person. You've said that you love to read, you love to draw, you love to talk. So maybe this is the wrong question for you, but you're the one I've got, so I'm going to ask you. <laughs> What's the uh, effect on socialization of you and your peers being in this program? Does it, does it isolate you? Does it make you separate? Does it make you feel great? Do you feel that you can socialize with kids who aren't in this type of program at other schools? Uh, do you have the same stuff to talk about? Um, I can, even if I didn't have something to, back, something to talk about, I would find something to talk about because I talk a lot. But <laughs> yes, um, I feel like I can really talk have more meaningful conversations with my peers than more like, oh, are you going to the mall this weekend? Blah, 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 yeah, yeah, you too. I can have deeper conversations with them, like, yeah, like, 
discuss things. Some things in the classroom, I find them interesting to talk outside of the classroom with my friends. I've made new friends out of Edison High School because they're also, because I went to MITRE too as a, in a field trip. I made friends there too. They are also, they're not in the STEM program, but they, they're interesting in the STEM career. I've made friends with them. I've made friends with people who are, interesting, who are interested in the STEM program who weren't there um, freshman year. Mm. I feel like I've, yeah, you can be really social and, yeah. In principle, you get the question that I'm asking though, right? Is there any danger in uh, socializing kids differently? I mean, we used to think about, you know, taking kids and advancing them in grades and now people sort of think twice yeah. about that. We, we are very, um, the way that we design the program is that yes, they're in the science, math, technology and in that cohort, but there are other classes they're in with everybody else in the school. So when she takes English or social studies or anything else, she's in with her peers. So it's designed that way so that they can be just regular high school kids. And that what she's learning hopefully will also be an influence mm -hmm. to students who are in those other classes who begin to ask her, well, what are you doing in that STEM program? Or when she's asking them something or saying, well, why do you approach it this way? Have you thought about it this way? That her learning will also have a ripple effect on other students. So that was designed that way. I think that they feel very comfortable. Um, they are part of the entire school. Uh, yes, there's a part of the building where we have the labs, but everything else, they are fully integrated into the fabric of the school. So uh, you all are advocates of this program, clearly. Was there any a po a point in this in, at which you weren't or you were worried about the risk of going down this road? Uh, uh, or, or did you, even if you weren't worried about it, how did you evaluate the risk of going down this road? I'll tell you honestly, the, uh, the grand challenges helped me overcome my fear because I thought that's just a really big ask. It's a really big ask to get 90 kids to sign up for something that's this strange. It's a big ask to get a new team of teachers together. Two of them came from out of the school and formed a team initially. Um, and it was helpful to have the structure of the grand challenges to point to and say, yeah, we're gonna work on these. And uh, we think that there's enough push um, nationally at some of the interest points of the grand challenges, we think we can really hang curriculum on these sort of deeply ingrained problems. Like, how do you get enough food? It's a big problem. Well, it turns out that there are people in the Edison community who are short on food. Is that a sufficient enough grasp that we could pull kids into that? It turns out it was. The other thing I would say as the building principal, um, I received a phone call early on before I, Scott was introduced to me, and so they were um, looking for a principal who might be willing to take this kind of risk. We talked about the program, we talked about my school, we talked about the demographics of my school, we talked about my goals and my values and beliefs, and I think one of the major things for me is I believe that it's important to take risks. I think it's important to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to help students learn and to help them learn better. And I think the other thing is that when I look at the success or how the students have grown this entire year, I can say it's been worth it. Um, there were risks. I mean, there are teachers, I, I'm very honest, who are not believers quite yet. So recruiting teachers for the program has not always been easy. It, it's new. And so people are sometimes afraid of the unknown. But I believe very, very firmly in if we can create authentic learning experience for kids, that they're going to be engaged. And we want to have them involved in things they care about. Mm -hmm. And so I would watch very often where students were not engaged. They didn't understand why they were learning this in the classroom. They found it boring. And we have a responsibility as educators to engage kids, to motivate them, to help them see the connections. So for me, it was definitely worth the risk. Uh, Francis, I got a question here. Uh, you're obviously extroverted, but it sounds like this program, uh, this, this is a program where extroverts can thrive. Uh, however, many STEM students are introverts. How does this program provide an environment where introverts can also th thrive? In the STEM program, I've said this a lot of times, but communication is key. You have to communicate with your group in order to succeed and find the solution to your problem. And so I feel I, I do have a lot of introverted friends, and I feel like being around a lot of people and having a lot of people that help you 
it doesn't necessarily make you like a extrovert where you're like partying all over the place, but it certainly opens you up to talk more, to um, ask more questions. Because I've been um, classmates with a couple of people and they joined the STEM program and they were really quiet, was all in the back of the class. And now I see them asking questions and I'll be like, that's a really good question, like good job. And it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a program where yes, introverts can thrive in, and so can extroverts. It's a, it's a program where everyone can succeed if they really try and believe that they can succeed in that program. Uh, Scott, to your earlier point about learn, uh, teaching people to solve problems, does this program necessarily, uh, this is a question I've got, uh, these, the program seems to be streamlining students toward engineering professions. How does the program expose students to problem solving skills without alienating them if they pursue fields outside of STEM? So I think one of the key aspects of the, the grand challenges is that it's engineers alone are not going to be able to solve these challenges. We need people with different backgrounds. Um, and that's kind of what we promote in the classroom, that there takes different experiences, different backgrounds, different skills, um, different knowledge bases to come together to collaborate. And just to expand upon what Francis was saying, that's probably one of the biggest challenges that the program faced in the first half of the first semester. Um, was that students for nine years of their lives have been going to school where they have, their success has been de demonstrated as an individual. Um, they've been regurgitating information, filling out worksheets, handing that in as an individual. Whereas now within this program, they're working in small groups and the teachers do a really good job of providing opportunities for them to collaborate physically face to face, but also using technology, like through Google Docs and having an opportunity to communicate through technology where an introvert might have an opportunity to share their ideas using technology if they're uncomfortable doing it in a face-to-face -face situation. Do you think that the methodology though, you're, that you're using is beneficial or advantageous regardless of whether technology is the end, end goal? Absolutely, I don't think it's the resources, I don't think it's uh, any of the technology that's utilized in the classroom, I think it's the instructional practice and that we're providing students with a context where a problem that they have to solve, and that gives them a reason for wanting to learn the content. It has nothing to do with the technology. It has nothing to do with any amount of dollars that have been spent on the program. Um, it's really about the instructional philosophy and practices that occur in the classroom. Well, this has been absolutely amazing. Thank you to the four of you for, uh, for coming and telling us all about it. A big round of applause to uh, Scott Setup, Pamela Brumfeld, Katie Sherry, and Francis Reyes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.